Today I'm back again uh, with Alice Molo, this one. Uh, today actually I'm recording this video in a different place. This is one of the uh, humanities building, I guess building number one, but I'm not sure about the, the, the name of this lecture. First of all, I would like to briefly review what we've done for last class uh, before the midterm essay. We've talked about uh, we've talked about Ellis Malone, and then I give you a brief introduction to uh, how she is a very well-known international author. And we've also talked about her writing style, which is not a complicated prose style, but the characteristic is that she is writing a uh, she's using a uncomplicated prose, but Within that, she embeds a complexity of human, especially ordinary people and ordinary life. That's one of the characteristic, main characteristics of her writing. And another one is that how she pursues uncertain truth. So what I have told you is that there's, for, for Alice Malone, there's no definite sense of truth because there is all the time a, a uncertainty. Uh, that's uh, another second main characteristic. Then let's move on to second half of the story. Uh, for the second half of the story, there are two specific figures, uh, the narrator's father and mother. Mm, but actually, it's presumably Alice Muller's own father and mother. In terms of the father, uh, the specific uh, contents when the narrator or Alice Muller introduces her father is that uh, he is for business. Um, I'm going to read the passage. It's on uh, 307. 307. 307. It's um, second paragraph from the top, or it's actually uh, just the middle, middle of the page. It's uh, one, two, three, four. It's four, fourth lines from the top of the second paragraph. I'm gonna read this aloud. The truth was that my father had got into the fur business just a little too late. This means that. There was a popular uh, time when the fur business was successful, but this means that her father, Ernest Mala, or the narrator's father, got into the business a little bit late. So had got into the fur business just a little too late, the success he had hoped for would have been more likely back in the mid-20s. This means that uh, 1920s or so. But um, do you remember the, the time period as the background of this story is that uh, is 30s, 1930s. But as you see, the successful period of the fur trend is mid-20s. So that way, her father, the narrator's father, Molno's father, got into the business a little bit late uh, when furs were newly, so during the mid-20s, uh, those, are, those are the periods when furs were newly popular and people had money. Why? Because that's after the World War and before the outbreak of the Second World War. So that's a very short temporary period when people had the money. Uh, but her father had got the study, uh, had not got the business for business at that, at that time. Um, but he still, the father, uh, let's look at page 308, the next page. It's, one, it's a second paragraph from the top. The sentence starts by, after the optimism of that season of redecoration. Why redecoration? Uh, right before this, pa right before this uh, page, the narrator depicts that how their house was renovated. Mm, so after the optimism of that season of redecoration, so he, the father still had optimism that his business, his business would be success. Uh, however, our business dried up again, and this time it never came back. My father pelted. Pelted means that here, the definition of pelting, oh, pelting is that skin is removed. This means that removing the skin of foxes or mink. So this is the definition of pelt, and this is how uh, father's, uh, father has done and got what shockingly little money he could for them. This means that uh, the money that 
the money he was supposed to get, he's supposed to earn, would be uh, much, I mean, to, could be little more, little more than this little money, but because of the declining timing, he got only a uh, little money. Uh, then he worked by day, pulling down the sheds. Sheds means uh, a roofed structure, basically a working place for, for this pelting. And he was pulling uh, down the sheds where that enterprise, the four enterprise, had been born and had died. This is the, how uh, the narrator's father's for business has ended. And the father, at this, at this point, had got a new job, which is, he got a new job at foundry. The foundry means that a facility that melts metals in special furnaces and pours the molten metal into molds to make products. Do you see this image? In terms of the pelting, do you see this image? This is the uh, product of the fur business and this is the end product of the fur business and this is the uh, image of the foundry. Uh, it's basically about the factory, it's basically about a, a factory uh, that makes a product of glass or metal. Uh, so the father has got a new job at the foundry. So this is the feature of Monlo's father and the narrator. Narrator, but actually Alice Monlo's own personal life, basically about declining or the or how Alice Monlo becomes poor during her childhood because of the decline of the fur business. Then let's move on to the next page about her mother, mother's illness. It's about page 308, one to its second paragraph from the bottom. Then the sentence starts by something had come upon us. You see, there's one incident that the decline of the business and there's one more thing, something had come upon us that was even more unexpected and would become more devastating than loss of income. Loss of income, is, which is I explained, it, I explained just like a moment ago, though we didn't know it yet. It was early onset of Parkinson's disease. This means that the narrator, uh, Monlo's mother, has an illness, became to, became to have an Ill illness, which is very serious one, Parkinson's disease, which showed up when her mother, my mother, was in her 40s. So this is another, um, another feature, or this is what the narrator talks about her mother. Mm. But, because her mother becomes sick due to the Parkins, uh, there's a change, actually huge change for the narrator, Monlo herself. When she was very young, uh, when she was actually nine years old, uh, it's the change in narrator's life due to mother's Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease. It means that it's, uh, this is the description on page 309. 309, it's the very last paragraph. Uh, very last paragraph on page 309. Once he was gone, once her father was gone to the foundry, gone to foundry, domestic chores, uh, sorry, I would start on supper. This means that the very little young, the very uh, young girl had to start, had to prepare for the supper for the rest of family, who are her younger sister and younger brother and the mother. And I could make things that I thought were exotic, like spaghetti or omelets, as long as they were cheap. And after the dishes were done, my sister had to dry them up, dry them, and my mother, my brother had to be nagged into throwing the dishwater dish out over the dark field. So this way, the domestic chores has been taken over uh, to the narrator, the very young Ellen Smallo, the nine years old. Uh, so this is a, could be a huge change for her life. Uh, in terms of the relationship between father and the narrator, the father or Ellen Smallo, uh, there's a, um, 
It's not all the time good. That's because her father was beating her. So Alice Munro later interviewed that she pointed out that there's a shame in her relationship with her father. But in terms of the relationship with her mother, it could be more serious, it could be more complicated. Uh, this is the excerpt from Alice Munro's interview uh, in, terms of her, in terms of her relationship with her mother. Uh, I'm gonna read this aloud. She, Alice Munro, says her feelings about her mother and it's that probably the deepest material, her mother, Alice Mollo's mother, is the deepest material of my life. I think when you are growing up, you have to pull apart from what your mother wants or needs. This means that at a certain point, um, even though mom has something, something, mother wants her daughter to do something, but at a certain point, the daughter has to choose her own way. I think this is what, what it means. Growing up, you have to pull apart from what your mother wants or needs. You've got to go your own way. So that way, Alice Munro also cho chose her own way. She decided her own way. And that's what I did. That's what Alice Munro did. And of course, she was in a, this she means her mother. Her mother was in a very vulnerable position, as I told you. Uh, it's not just about the personality, but be mainly because of the illness, the Parkinson's. Uh, she was in a very vulnerable position, which in a way was also a position of power. So that was always a central thing in my life. That the, the central thing in Alice Monroe's life is that she did pull away from her mother when she was deeply in need. This means that Alice Malo, uh, even though her mother was very desperately in need of her daughter, Alice Malo chose her own way, uh, did pull away from her when she was deeply in need. And yet, I still feel that I did it for a salvation. So this means that Alice Munro's decision to go her own way is her choice of salvation. It's a salvation for Alice Munro herself, not for her mother. Superficially, I was very kind to my mother, but I never allowed myself to enter into her predicament. This means that there's limited sympathy between the daughter, Alice Munro, and her mother. That way, what she's talking about here is that feeling guilty. Uh, and that's how the relationship between mother, the relationship between Alice Munro and her mother could be more complicated than that of the relationship with her father. Looking backward, the memories of the father and mother. The two main things are the financial hardship here, the financial hardship during the childhood, you know, the declining of the fur business, and feeling guilty of what she has done to her mother. So this is two main characteristics when Alice Muller goes backward her memories during her childhood. Uh, so this time, what Alice Muller is doing is that by looking backward, by looking backward, Alice Muller reshapes her memory. This means that Alice Muller retouches her memory. Uh, through Mrs. Netterfield episode, do you remember that episode? It's page 310. It's a third paragraph from the top and fourth paragraph from the bottom. It starts by, the sentence starts by several times she told me a story, etc. Um, very briefly put, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna go the detail of this whole episode. I'm, I'm gonna make it brief. So the two characteristics of Mrs. Nettlefield is that one of the episodes is about the grocery boy who didn't bring the butter. And this time, Mrs. Nettlefield uh, grabbed the hatchet. Hatchet is like, it's X. Two, it seems that the Mrs. Nettlefield seems to want to punish the grocery, the grocery boy who didn't bring the butter. So the, that's the first episode. And the second one is that, by the way, uh, at this point, what we, uh, what we remind is that, what 
we have to remind us that Mrs. Netherfield is not normal. She's kind of insane. Uh, the second episode is that when Mrs. Netherfield peers into the narrator's house. So basically, the two episodes about the Mrs. Netherfield is, I mean, are, the, so both episodes are not pleasant, but actually could be scary, even life-threatening. So it's uh, the whole thing, the whole episode, it's not pleasing, it's not pleasant. It's, it's not the memory that I want to look back, but Alice Munro revises that memory. How? Uh, on page 316, 316, the narrator, Munro, uh, describes that it's one to, it's actually uh, the, the second paragraph from the top. After I was married and had moved to Vancouver, it's in that passage, and that way the narrator Mm, after several decades, accidentally read a poem on a weekly paper which was written by the same name, uh, Netherfield. This is the poem written by the name Netherfield. I'm going to read this poem aloud. I know a greasy hillside, a greasy hillside, above a river clear, a place of peace, a place of peace and pleasure, and there, a memory very dear. So for these two, by, by the way, do you remember these two places? It's the, the images that I have that I have, that I have shown you last class. Uh, this is the actual places Alice Muller was very much familiar with during her childhood. So all of these places are full of Alice Muller's dear memory. The second stanza, the sun upon the river where the ceaseless sparkles play and over on the other bank are blossoms wild and gay. Across the iris bordered stream, the shade of maple spread. So uh, for these two images, we are not able to see the shades of maple spread, but over yonder probably, we can imagine that there could be the shades of maples. And on the river's waterly, we can also imagine that on the river's uh, watery field, white geese in flocks are fed. So we can imagine like that way. So this way, Alice Munro inserts these two images of her memory during her childhood, and that way she revises the episode of Netherfield, which was originally a very scary one. Uh, for here, Alice Munro um, describes this, this memory. Not the memory actually, but the, the thing, the memory that is in relation to the name of Mr. Mrs. Netherfield. So that way, Alice Malo uh, revisits her memory and reshapes it. So when the narrator listens to the story of Mrs. Netherfield during her childhood, she might have experiencing unpleasant time, as I told you, due to decline of father's fur business and mother's Parkinson's disease. In a sense, those fearful mood of Netherfield episode is not isolated the narrator's hard times during the early days. This means that uh, Netherfield episode could symbolize how um, Alice Mono's own personal history, her own pers personal past could be unpleasing. But uh, after several decades, the narrator, or presumably Mono herself, retouches the tone and the texture of the memory. Um, of the Netherfield episode, thereby the Netherfield episode along with her childhood memory by reading and inventing, reading or could be inventing uh, Netherfield's form. And in the revised memory in that of the Netherfield's form, the memory was not the unpleasant one, but the, mem but the memory was very dear. This is what Alice Munro talks about dear, her definition, the, the meaning of dear for Alice Munro. Uh, by the way, the second one, uh, not the yellow one, but green box, uh, there's a definition of dear. Uh, it's used in expressions of three different emotions, surprise, dismay, or sympathy. So these are the three uh, different uses for, for dear. And this is the excerpt of Alice Muller's interview when she talks about her own understanding of dear. Do 
those words, actually those words means the three different uses, different uses of dear. Uh, the, so those words are very wonderful to me because I heard them when I was a child and they had all kinds of meaning. The dear, the word dear could have all kinds of meaning, not a very single one. Uh, oh, for life. So that's one thing. It would just mean that you were kind of overwhelming with all that had been required of you. This means that this overwhelming thing could be related to Alice Muller's own uh, past during her childhood. Uh, but on the other hand, I like the contrast between that and the words dear life, which are maybe joyful resignation. So on the one hand, if the meaning of dear is something about the overwhelming, but on the other hand, the meaning of dear could be joyful resignation. When you say dear, it's the word. It does not bring up sadness. So for Alice Malone, it does not bring up the sadness, but it brings to something very precious one. So to sum up this short story, um, at the end, what we see as the reader is that the narrator is revisiting the past memory, especially through Mrs. Netherfield's episode. And by that way, uh, the narrator reshapes her memory of childhood and by revising the fearful memory of Netherfield, the narrator, Munlo, makes her past memory more dear and precious one. So this is how Munlo approaches to dear life. Even though throughout all the story, throughout the whole the short story, even though we didn't, we didn't, we may not feel a certain uh, precious or pleasant one, but this is how Alice Munlo approaches her own way of dear life. So for next class, I'm going to sum up Sharon Butala and Alice Marlowe, not the individual Canadian authors, but in the frame of Canadian literature. And I'm going to move on to Irish literature by introducing to one Irish poem, probably. So that's uh, the end of class and then I will stop here. Thank you for listening. <laughs>